right, okay. go live. Going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we are talking about carving compound angles, particularly on rounded handles and totes, things that come in contact with your hand. And uh, this is one of those fun topics that really kind of scares a lot of people, but it's surprisingly easy. What? It just washed you all out again. <laughs> it washed me out again? Yeah. Did it just change? Yeah. Huh. I've got a problem with my camera, and I don't know what's up with it, so I'm going to be a little bit uh, white today. Here, let me see if I can drop it down one more stop. <laughs> but, uh, no, that way, there we are. Um, let's see if it holds this time. <laughs> of course, now I'm in the shadow zone. Uh, so, if you are new to the channel, we do like to have technical difficulties here. Uh, we do put all of the questions that have been asked down in the comments down below so you can see through the, uh, the questions and jump to them with the timestamps. Uh, if you are watching this live, then go ahead and throw your questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we can. Um, but we like to start off with announcements so that if you want to know what's happening in the Wood by Right world, you can just tune in for the first couple minutes. Uh, number one, June 14th to the 17th is the uh, National Meet in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, it is the MWTCA National Meet. It is the largest tool sale in the world. It's amazing. And particularly if you can be there Thursday morning sunrise uh, for the tailgate sale, it, uh, that's, it's wonderful. Um, I've been trying to talk to them to try and move the tailgate sale to Saturday which would be absolutely awesome. Um, but for right now, it's on the Thursday morning. But that's the 14th and through the 17th um, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. You have to remember to go to any of the MWTCA meets, um, but it's well worth the membership. Um, number two, I might, um, this one's still up in the air, be going to Washington, D.C. Uh, July 16th for the Patina meet. Uh, Patina is another um, tool collecting organization. They have a meet out there that happens, I believe, four times a year. And I haven't ever actually been able to go out to one of those. Um, but it's just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and then the, the big one, if you go to one thing this year, and it's worth traveling to, is Handworks. It is in September 1st and 2nd, um, Amana, Iowa. It's an entire town devoted to hand tools. Uh, there are tools for sale. Every maker, if there's a company out there that makes traditional hand tools, they will be there. Uh, so you can play with the tools. There are barns set aside for demonstrations. Um, there are uh, meet and greets. Uh, it's, you're going to see Roy Underhill there. I'm going to be there. Rex is going to be there. I think Anne is going to be there. Uh, pretty much all of the names in the hand tool world will be there. Um, Rex and I are going to be doing a meet and greet at some point. Haven't decided when yet. Uh, but it's like Disney World for hand tools for two days short. Um, so Handworks, go to handworks.co um, and you can find out more about that. It's free to go to, you just have to show up. Um, but if you do sign up ahead of time for free, um, then you are entered for door prizes. Um, another one that I might be going to uh, is Raleigh, North Carolina, September 16th. It's kind of smushed into the others, so I don't know if I'm going to make that one, but that's one that's been high on my list for a long time. Um, but that's a MWTCA meet with uh, um, Ed. Um, really cool one out there. Uh, and then the, the second national that kind of closes out the season, that will be the end of September. It's the 28th through the 30th in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, and so that's just like what's happening in Green Bay, just Des Moines, Iowa. Um, national meet, tool gates, uh, tailgate sale on Thursday. Um, tools sold all throughout the whole time. Lots of fun. Okay. Oh. What's that? Are you done? Yep. So uh, you made me type peach meat, but people don't know what peach meat is. Oh, well, yeah. Then if you go a little farther ahead, um, in February, uh, there is the peach meat um, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's in Madison, Georgia. Um, it, it is the biggest tool sale in the South. Uh, it's a two-day long event. Um, the first day, they have tailgating outside, and then they move it inside um, for the second day. I, I've been down to it two or three times now. And it's one of my favorites. It's a really, really nice one. And it's the biggest one in the South. So if you're anywhere within, you know, six hour drive, it's well worth it. Um, do, people do fly in from all over the place to go to it. So it's a big one. But that is, um, that's an MWTCA meet. You have to be a member of the MWTCA. Um, just like the, the national, uh, they actually just sent out the invites today for the national event in June. Um, and you have to be a member to get the invite. So um, go to mwtca.org. It's 25 bucks a year, and you get all sorts of publications with it. It's way, way worth the money. Um, it's really, really, really cool event. Um, and then you get invited to local meets. So, yeah. 
Um, I think that's it. So let's actually dive into the, the talk tonight. Um, so what I've got here is I'm currently working on a tote for a plane. And uh, this one is going to be completely out of focus. Ooh, come on, wake up. There we go. This image may actually have a better color. <laughs> um, so I'm working on this one right now. Uh, this is one that's very similar that I did before of the same style. Uh, and this is a organic shaped handle. Uh, in other words, the curvature here is not the same as the curvature here, and it's not the same as the curvature here. All the way along this, the radius of that curvature changes, and that's because your hand changes, and so it's designed to fit your hand, and where your hand actually comes into contact at different places, it's rounded differently. So it's a little bit deeper here where the pinky wraps around, and it's a little less here where the, uh, the middle finger doesn't wrap quite as much. Um, so you're making something that is an organic shape. Now, a lot of people think, well, why don't I just grab a router and run around it like this? Well, this handle may be better than a square handle, but once you've felt a good handle, this just doesn't feel good. Now you can see a router just went around this and created the shape. Now, this is the way most cheap handles are made now, um, if they're not plastic cast. And the reason is it's fast, it's easy, it's efficient. No one has to do anything about this. There's no hand to this. It's just routed and done. Um, the closest I've seen it come to very, very well done is Veritas. Their saw handles, uh, they're similar, but you can still see there was a router that went around here and here, and it's the same radius at every spot. They've bulged things out a bit more, so it does actually fit the hand a little bit better, but it's still just not quite there. It doesn't have the same feel as something that was hand-shaped to actually fit your hand. But then you can take it a step farther, and this is one uh, from, excuse me, uh, from, uh, um, okay, what's the name again? File and Hammer, Jared Green. <laughs> I was like, um, what's that? I, I knew that answer. <laughs> um, and so this is a hand-filed hammer. Now, it was probably initially shaped with a router, but then you can come in with a file and up here increase the radius, and you can see how the radius changes all the way along this. And that means that someone actually came in here with a file and hand shaped this down. All of this in the top was hand shaped. All of this little detail up here was hand shaped. And this detail up here lets you know, yes, this was hand shaped. Someone put enough time into this that they wanted to make it. And this just, it feels amazing because it is an organic shape to fit an organic hand. And once you've gotten a chance to play with one and know the feel of it, um, you understand why it is so uh, beloved. Now that doesn't mean you can't do good work with a cheap handle. Sure you can. Uh, but once you get used to it, that one feels better. And the more you feel in tune with the saw, the more everything just clicks. I can make these two saws do the same thing, but which one am I going to grab? I'm going to grab the good one because this one just feels better and it gives me less struggle. Whereas this one, there's just something about it that just doesn't want to obey me. And uh, yeah, it, it's kind of hard to say, but if you have the choice between one or the other and you've had the chance to learn what that feels like, you don't want to go back to it. It's sort of like getting a balcony on a cruise ship. Once you get the balcony, you don't want to go back to the interior. Unless you have kids, then you're like, oh, the interior sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I just like how you said it doesn't obey you. Like that didn't give some control issues or anything. <laughs> <laughs> So how do we actually go about doing that? We end up using rasps and files. Um, and this is one of those things when I got into hand tools, I'd never thought about using rasps and files to do anything. You usually would use a router, you'd make your shape, and then you'd come in with sandpaper and you'd clean it up. Um, and uh, these allow you to do a lot more and allow you to do it very, very quickly. Did we miss a super chat? No, um, Brian Federson uh, joined Welcome to Ah, oh, hey. Became a new member. Welcome to the ship. We do crazy things. Um, so basically I want to show the difference between a rasp and a file before we get going. And a rasp and a file are very, very similar except for the teeth on a file go all the way across. Oop. The teeth on the file go across the plate. Whereas a rasp has all of these tiny little teeth. Let me grab a, a heavier one. And all of these tiny little teeth in here are cut in. Now this one is actually hand stitched. So you can see that every one of these is in a weird and different place. There is no pattern to this. Whereas this one is machine stitched. 
Um, now there are a couple companies that make machine stitched with a random pattern, um, but they are hard to find and they aren't that much cheaper than a hand stitch file. So every one of these little nubs uh, was actually punched in by a human being, uh, which makes them very expensive. Um, the difference between a machine stitched and a hand stitched file, uh, these are usually like four or five times as much. But they, because they're not all in sync, they don't vibrate as they go across and you get a much smoother, cleaner cut. Uh, so they just feel better. They don't give you any better cut particularly as long as you control them right, um, but they are much more forgiving as you go. Uh, so basically the idea is you use something really coarse with big teeth to take off all the material and you get close to the shape. And then you come in with something that's a little bit finer and you remove the scratches from the first one you get really close to your shape. And then you come in something that's a little bit finer and usually at this point I go from rasp to a file and I get rid of all of the rasp marks. And then I come in with something that's even finer than that and I get rid of all of those marks. And then I come in with something that's really, really fine and very, very smooth, and this gives me my finished surface. And so I'm kind of stepping down through these. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, most of mine are this half round um, style. And so you have a round on this side and flat on this side, it allows you to get um, interior and exterior surfaces. And even with my smaller ones, they're all the same um, shape, half round on one side, flat on the other. Um, except for I have a few rat tails, like this one is a large round, um, and then I have a couple of these uh, th smaller ones. This one's actually designed for uh, chainsaw chains, um, and these allow you to get into smaller surfaces. So I don't use these ones that much, and I don't have many fine ones of this, um, but if you really need to get finer than this, you could just wrap sandpaper around a dowel. Um, at this point, a lot of people are going to be talking about, oh, you should get a Shinto rasp, um, and Shinto rasps are really, really good. Oh, you're just... Oop, wrong button. Let's do that one. Shinto rasps are um, efficient, clean, and they're they're great, but they're not great at compound curves. They're great anytime you have a straight edge you're going to be rounding the corner on. That comes really, really fast and efficient, and I like them for that. But anytime I'm doing something where it's rounding this way and this way, I find them to dig in more and be more of a pain than they're worth. Um, but that being said, um, a lot of people really like them. It kind of comes down to a per personal preference. Um, any questions while I jump into this? Um, Alex wants to know, how many different size rasps are there and do I really need all of them? <laughs> um, when it comes to rasps and files, the sky is the limit. No one on earth has all of the shapes and styles. Um, I have a set of uh, rifflers and I've got over 300 of them and none of them are duplicate and I don't have anywhere near all of them. Um, you don't need that many. For most work when I'm working on these, um, I have a series of um, half rounds. Um, I have a really coarse rasp, a fine rasp, a fairly coarse file, a relatively fine file, and a very fine file. And you notice how they get finer, they also get smaller, from the big one down to the little one, uh, because you tend to be doing a little bit closer, more detailed work. Um, most of the work is done with those half rounds. Um, now, I didn't talk about this one. This is a four in hand. Uh, this one is kind of fun because it has everything you need in one place. It is a half round, it's rounded on this side and flat on the other. And I've got a rasp here and a file here and I flip it over and I've got the rasp here and the file here. So it's kind of four files in one. And I can do a lot with this. The one downside to it is I have yet to find a high quality four in one. Uh, they are all low quality, they get the job done. Um, and if you have to buy one tool, that's the one. Don't, don't mess with any of these until you get one of these. Um, this will treat you really well. Getting a four in hand, you can do almost all of it. It's just not gonna be quite as comfortable. You can get these over time. And I do have links to all of them down in the description down below. Um, I, I really wish someone would make a good four in one. Um, I haven't found one yet. Um, I would like one to have a little bit more curvature on this side. This side is just kind of a, it's a very large radius and I would like to get one that has a smaller radius. Um, I would love to get one that's closer to like, uh, ow, hit my eye. <laughs> I'd love to get one that's more like, like that radius on there. Uh, but I haven't yet found one. And I would love to find one with a hand stitch rasp, um, but that would probably make this somewhere around a hundred bucks. Um, but for me, that would actually, that would be worth it. This is an old Nicholson, um, but honestly, in comparison to the new ones, the, the cheap ones are just as good as this. 
um, they will work just as well. So I have one um, that you can get really, really, really cheap ones, um, or you can get the decently cheap ones. And so the one I have down below is a, is a decent one, will last you well, um, but it's not, it's not amazing. Nice thing about these is they're all very good at it and very detailed. Um, do you need all the shapes? No, I have lots of others. I have triangles and, and squares and other weird, odd shapes, and I have big files, and I have circular tooth floats. And most of those are specialties that only come in every now and then. A lot of them I use for plane making. Um, and files are one of those things that you just kind of collect over time. Um, I go to estate sales and there's usually a bucket in the basement or out in the garage and they've got 30 some files in there and they'll sell it for 20 bucks. And I'll buy the bucket and I'll take them home and I will throw out and recycle most of them but I'll keep one or two out of the bucket. Um, and that's how I've gotten most of my files of those um, large vats. I just actually had a re uh, estate sale this last weekend and there was sure enough a bucket down in the basement it was full of files. I passed up on it because most of the ones I already had but uh, that's where I've gotten most of mine. Um, so let's actually take a look at this. Oop, bring this around over here. What I have is I put a hand screw in my vise, and this allows me to get far more detailed work. Um, I get these, oop, um, I get the jaws up top here that allow me to get things a lot closer. And so putting this in, number one, lifts it up closer to my face so I can see it. But number two allows me to very quickly move this around. James. What's that? Can you focus it, please? Oh, sure. Ooh, that'd be better. Hey, Thank look at that. You. Here, let me actually move this over here and tip it up a bit. There we go. So we're working about there. There we go. One of these days I'll pay someone to come in and video work. Um, so I'm going to be doing this inside curve because these larger outside curves are relatively easy. Actually, let me do a little bit of this outside curve just to explain that first. And I'm going to start with a four in hand on this side to explain what we're doing. Um, actually, let's bring it around to this side. Ooh, don't yank the cable. Don't rock the boat, baby. Sit down here rocking the boat. There we go. Uh, so let me grab my four in hand. And this area here I've already done. I want to do this. Actually, I'm going to move it over a little bit more and get that in image. There we go. There we go. And I'm going to come in with the file side. I'm actually going to use the rounded face. And yes, I'm going back and forth on it. Um, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, you should only push it forward. Um, that's actually an old myth that you ruin it going backward and forward. Let me get it close. And like that, we've gotten it very, very close. I got a little more here to do. And so then I can take this, rotate around, go to the file side, and I can start to get rid of those marks. Sometimes people will actually draw lines on here to know how far they want to go. And like that, I've gotten the shape of that spot relatively well. Get that focus back there. All right. While you're doing that, what's the centerpiece of your handle made of? The centerpiece of my handle? It's a different color. Oh, uh, this is actually uh, maple and torrified maple. Um, so heat treated. So I've gotten this. You can see there's some lines on here still. Um, the foreign hand is not going to get any finer than that. So in that case, I would jump in here to a finer file. And I'm going to come in up from a slightly different angle and get rid of those file marks. I've gotten pretty close. I've got new file marks, which I don't even know if you guys are going to be able to see those. Let me see if I can zoom in on these a little bit better. Sorry, I'll get the focus here in a moment. I want to focus. Right there is where I want to focus. You're not going to be able to see, are you? No, you're not going to. Uh, can't get any closer than that with this lens. Yeah, it's about as close as I can get. You can still see some marks right here. And so I'm trying to get rid of those. I'm working back around, trying not to stay in any one spot. And I also got this nice harsh line here. Some people like to keep that harsh line. I prefer one don't. It shows that it's been hand filed, um, but I like to get rid of it. 
Once I've gotten it close, then I come into my finest file. And you can hear how it gets slightly higher pitch as it goes along. And I'm blending all of those facets together, seeing where any issues are. And that's gotten pretty close. And so at this point, I'm starting to put my hand on there and feeling where do I feel any issues. I could come in with a tiny bit of sandpaper. And what this will do isn't sand it smoother, but it will show me if there's any defects. That one actually looks pretty good. Normally you'll see any ridges, and there's a little bit of a ridge there. So I can spend just a little more time hitting that spot. And again, don't stay in any one spot, just keep moving. Starting to get a nice glossy finish up here. Let's see if I can get that in focus. And I'm liking that. So it's a lot of just going through the steps, and what I'll end up doing with this is taking it piece by piece and doing each spot individually. Um, and a lot of times what I'll end up doing is I'll do all of the spots until I get to the finest file, and I'll leave the finest file alone uh, until I do the whole thing. And at that point, I'm kind of feeling it in my hand. I'm seeing where are the rough points, where do I want to work on it more. And once I get it close to where I want it, and everything's feeling right about right other than there's a few marks I want to get rid of, then I'll go over all with the fine file and really clean it up. Um, or I could come in with the card scraper, or a curved card scraper, and get into the small spaces and scrape it out. Um, I usually don't like doing the card scraper as much as the file. I find the file to be a little faster and more flexible. Now, the problem isn't these outside curves. The problem is when you get to the inside curves. Um, and so on this one, let me see if I can move the camera. Ooh, let me move this. That's where the cable's attached. Do this without getting in the way. The inside curves are the pain. So I've got this spot here that I need to do. And this rasp just doesn't have the curvature needed to get into here. Now I can kind of work it. Tighten that down a little more. And I can kind of use the edge of it to come in from this side and use the edge come in from this side and I can get it kind of close but I'm never going to be able to get this one in there. Um, so in that case that's where I get this big rat file um, which is a round file basically and with this I can get in here and because it's a file it's going to take a little longer so I got to have a little more patience but I'm just trying to use it to get this inspired. And you'll also notice that I'm starting with it almost parallel to this outside face. And as I continue around, I'm rolling it. So I'll be rolling here, and I'll do a few passes here, and then slowly roll it until I'm almost on the inside. And I'm just doing from here around to here, because at this point up here, it's back to another flat. And so I could come in my rasp again. Do that area. Start by turning it into a 45. Let me go back to the round inside. Stopping occasionally to check. And that's getting pretty close. So we can switch over to the finer file. One file I don't have is I don't have a very fine, large rat file. This one's not too bad, but it's not really fine. And so sometimes I'm coming in with a smaller rat file, and I just have to be a little softer with it. I don't want it to dig in, but I want it to fit that profile. But in this case, this rounded file is small enough, I can actually fit that in there. You can see I'm, as I'm going in and out, I'm also rotating my wrist. And rotate again. I find it faster to get some of these small strokes 
And then when I really want to smooth it out, I take nice, long, smooth, slow strokes with a stop in between so that I can see my work. Then we can come into the fine file. And really smooth that out. And that's starting to feel really good. There's a couple little nicks in here that have to be worked out. But that's one of the fun parts where you can really drive yourself crazy because you can spend a lot of time. Um, and I, I, making this handle, I will probably spend about 15, maybe 20 minutes doing the general shape with the coarse file, with the coarse rasp, the fine rasp, um, and then the fine file. 15, 20 minutes total to shape it. And then I'll spend another two, maybe three hours with my last two files and really get it down and detail it. And if I really want to spend a lot of time on this, um, if I really want to make it nice, um, I'm probably going to end up spending four or five hours just doing the detail work on this. Um, now that being said, the better you get at it, the faster it goes, but also the more picky you get. And the more picky you get, the longer it takes. So it's one of those things that can take forever. And if you want to get one with a nice, clean finish afterwards where you can put a glossy shape on it, um, that takes a lot of work and a lot of patience. Um, and most people just end up getting close with the files and then going out with sandpaper. Because uh, sandpaper is really, really forgiving. It doesn't leave marks like files do. Um, but I don't like the finish it gives quite as much. So six of one up does another. Well, um, what questions we have? We have lots, but I always feel like the totes make me think of rabbits. And totes? I want to call it a rabbit. Yeah, that's what you were just doing. Oh. They look like little bunnies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. And then, so that's why when I was first learning tools on rabbit plane, I was like, that looks like a rabbit, but that's <laughs> not correct. But anyways, I digress. I like that one. Um, all right, I'm just going to kind yeah, of... Yeah, let's do a few questions before I jump into the next thing. Well, what are you going to talk about? Because that might dictate what questions... I might. Guys. If I hit it, then we'll jump into that. Oh, so okay, fine. Go for it. Um... Mormon asks, how would a farrier's rasp go for using in woodwork? Uh, do I still have that one over here? Yes, I do. <laughs> a farrier's rasp um, is, well, here, this one is a little bit small for an average farrier's rasp. Oop, turn that back on. Um, but it's designed for um, hoofs. Um, and so one side is basically a rasp, and the other side is basically a file, kind of like a four-in-one. But it's really, really big and very, very wide, and has teeth on the sides. And honestly, it does work for, for wood. The problem is it's so wide, um, I can't really get into anything. So if I'm doing this piece here, um, let's see, I could do out here and down to like here. But there's no way I could do anything inside here. Um, and on this side, I could do like that much of it, but there's no way I could do anything on the inside. So yes, there are times when you can do it. But it, honestly, I would consider it to be much like the Shinto rasp, is that it's great for flat or any one-dimensional curve. Um, but anytime you put in a second dimension into it, uh, it just doesn't perform as well. And especially if that one's just really, really big, it would have to be a very, very large sloping curve for that one to work. So yeah, a farrier's rasp would work, but it's a little annoying. It, okay, you know what that makes me think of? What's that? Tim Allen in Home Improvement. It's like need more power. I need a bigger <laughs> rasp. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> What's next? Tell me what generation you are without telling me what generation you are. <laughs> um, John Hayes asked, what makes a left tool left compared to being right-handed? Um, none of the files are right or left. They're all the, the same. Um, there, are, there are very few that are specifically left-handed in the workshop. Most of them are ambidextrous. Um, you have shooting boards. Uh, well, when you get up to molding planes um, and uh, um, combination planes, those ones are all um, left and right. And I actually don't know if... I think Veritas makes a left-handed combination plane. But I've never heard of any other company making a left-handed combination plane. Um, but shooting board planes, those are left and right. Um, and up until Veritas, they were all right-handed. No one ever made left-handed shooting board planes. 
What's next? Hosman asked, how essential is a curved rasp for making saw handles? Um, a curved rasp as in a half round um, is almost essential. Um, particularly when you're getting into saw handles, um, you need to get into these intricate inside shapes, these small inside curves. Um, like everything inside here, you would have to do with a half round. There's no way you could get a flat file to do any of this because it's all inside curve. Um, so yeah, they're pretty necessary. Now, I mean, theoretically you could do it all with rat tail files. Um, you just have to be very, very careful with a rat tail file because it is rounded. You're always only putting pressure on this rounded surface that's touching. And this is a smaller radius than you're ever going to be, than you, you'd be filing at any point. Um, so you're only touching in one spot. So the, the tendency is to put a lot of pressure into it. And when you're working with a rat tail or a rounded surface, you want to take a very, very light cut. Let the tool do the work. Don't put any extra weight into it. Um, sometimes you're even taking some weight off and the weight of the tool might be too much. Um, you don't want to put much pressure into it. What did I say? It's just my mind. <laughs> the way you're holding it. And then I was like, Harry Potter, they have different tail like things in the wand. So then I was like, is the woodworker's wand made with the rat's tail? <laughs> I'm running on little sleep. I see people. this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I digress. Moving on. You're cute though. I'm glad I'm something. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Uh, how about a question? Ken Carlisle asks, what about modeler's rasps worthwhile after one already has a cabinet maker's rasp question? Um, I don't know what would be particularly considered a model rig, right, maker's rasp. Let me take a look at it. PRS. Oh, well, yeah, those are... In, um, in the woodworking world, those are called rifflers. Um, yeah, so it's basically the same thing, just a different name apparently for um, different terms. Um, but yeah, that's to be called rifflers. Rifflers are more for um, cleaning up carving, um, getting into really intricate places. And if you're really getting into small detailed things, rifflers can be useful. Um, particularly if you want to do, um, no, that's not one. Let me see if I've got one of the lambs. Ah, here we go. So in this handle, um, I've got this lamb's tongue and getting into that small space and detailing in there. Um, I used a couple rifflers for detailing that out. Um, and so for, for little things, they are very, very useful. Um, but for most general cabinet working, um, they're not. Um, there's a reason why this is called the cabinet maker's rasp, um, because it is for more general, larger um, size curvatures. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Is that a super chat? It is. Eddie, Eddie Parker. Parker says, what about a float file? Uh, a float is a whole nother ball of wax. Uh, let me grab my floats. Do, 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 do. Um, and if you want, I've got several videos on what's the difference between floats, files, and rasps. Um, a float is basically a file in that the teeth go all the way across. Um, but they just go across, in general, in one path. Um, and most of the times with floats, um, they are actually um, soft or softer metal so that you can shape them and re-sharpen um, them, um, much like you would a saw. Basically, a float is a very, very fat, wide saw. Um, and some of them are even um, tighter. Let me grab my, where's my eighth inch? Where'd you go? He's hiding on me. No sé. Oh, well. Um, I'll give up on that one. I'll find it later. Um, so this one is actually a cross-cut pattern tooth. Um, but this is a, 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 a plane maker's float. Um, so in the cabinet world... Oh, duh. I was looking for the one I grabbed earlier. Uh, whereas this one is more like a, a rip saw um, tooth. But uh, plane makers floats um, are great for getting into the, the thin mouth and shaping them out. Uh, they're basically aggressive files. Um, floats are files with big teeth and usually they're not cross hatched, they're just one across. Most of the time they are softer so that you can sharpen them. Um, so it is that aggressive. Oh, also you'll get um, 
curved tooth files or curved tooth floats, though most of the time with the curved tooth, they are not soft. Um, they're hardened, so because you really can't reshape those easily. Um, but a curved tooth file just makes it a little bit smoother and easier to, to push. Again, with files and rasps, all of these have all of those profiles, plus all of the aggressiveness of coarse, medium, and fine, and rasp, and file, and float, and, and then you get into rifflers and have other intricate, weird shaped bent styles. Um, the, the, the sizes and shapes are off the chart. And so that's why I, I, I don't tell people go out and buy a set or anything like that. It's one of those things you'll collect over time and you know maybe buy two or three, um, like particularly the ones I use more than anything else are the half round rasp. Um, I'll have a coarse and a medium to a fine. And then where's my half round file? Yeah, there it is. A half round file, a, a medium half round file. Um, you get those and then a couple little fine detail half round files. And you can do 99% of your work with those. You know, go to the big box store and get a, uh, a rat tail for sharpening uh, um, chainsaw chains um, and you can get by with those um, or even just a foreign hand. And then after that, you'll eventually find that, yeah, I've got a shape coming up and I don't have a file that can do that shape. I should probably go look for that file. Then you'll buy that file. And the next time you'll be like, hmm, I've got a shape that I've got to make that. I should go buy that file. And then you're going to be buying collections of old files and you'll find one or two out of them you want to keep. Um, and the files just have a tendency to grow with you with time. Um, so don't ever think about going out and I need all these files. No, start with the few that you need. Um, and then everything else will grow with time. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, but if you're just looking for one to start with, a foreign hand is amazing. And I have links to the ones I'm, I'm talking about um, down below. What's next? You ready for a mom joke? Oh, yes. What has he got? All right. You ready? Why did no one laugh at the joke about the faulty guillotine? What? Poor execution. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> oh, speaking of um, plane makers floats, uh, Red Rose Reproductions just came out with a set of them and it's a small run. If I had the money, I would jump at them. They are expensive, but they're amazing. Um, and I really, really love a set, but I don't have the money for it. Um, that and I, I, I already have similar ones. Um, but they're hard to find good plane makers floats. Um, so if you're ever looking at making planes in the future, um, go to Red Rose Reproductions and look those up now because they'll be sold out in the next couple weeks. What's next? Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, Brian Federson asked, how would someone looking to get into woodworking start, given how you mentioned how many tools there are and want to make furniture for the house? Yeah, this is one of the big problems that people have when they're first getting into it is they, they see all of these. I have several videos talking about what planes do I actually use and what saws do I actually use and what files do I actually use um, because I have all of these up here because a lot of these I might use once a year and I only use it once a year because I have it. If I don't have it, then I've got another one. I have something else that will do. Just won't do it quite as well. Um, so when you're first getting it started out, don't plan on buying all the tools. You only need a few and I've got several videos on what tools should I buy first. Um, you need one or two decent saws, you need one nice plane, you need a way to sharpen them, um, a brace and bit, a mallet, a good set of chisels, and you can build 99% of the things out there with those. Um, everything else then is specialized. Um, and that's why I'm even mentioning files. You're getting into things like handles and totes and ornate designs. Uh, that's a specialized piece of work. Um, and the more you get into it, the more you get specialty tools for that one thing that you might only do once a year. But uh, when you do, it's a lot of fun because you have the tool for it. Um, so don't buy the tools because you want the tools. Buy the tool because you have a project that is going to require that tool. And so, you know, buy the basic set, mallet, chisel, saw, plane, and then everything else after that, you buy it for when you have it coming up in the project. So you look at the project and you think, how am I gonna do this joint, this joint, and this joint? Oh, that would be a good one to get this tool for. Um, don't go and buy the tools ahead of time. Buy them for the project and uh, you'll be much, much happier. What's next? 
All right. Uh, do you have anything else to explain? Um, not really. Let's break it into a. a, a All right. Just Q&A. making sure. So throw in your questions, and we'll see how many we oh, get. Don't throw too many more questions in. We got several pulled out already. Oh, okay. Um, Jay Von Dehar asked, "How do you prevent blowout when using a rasp? I like mine, but I wind up with chewed up edges." Um, it all depends on grain direction, and just like anything else, um, grain direction is very, very important. So I'm going to put up here the end of this board, and. Focus in. There we go. Actually, let me bring it out to like here so I can work on it. And let's focus on that. There we go. So I've got the end of this board here. And I'm going to come at it with a really aggressive rasp. rasp. So here I'm going to be starting and I'm basically going with the grain. Now I'm not getting much of any tear out. But if I come up here on the edge and I go across the grain, now I'm going to be getting these splinters coming up here. And so what I could do to stop that is rather than going across the grain, I could come in this way and go with the grain. Um, also, at the end grain, rather than going straight and flat across, because what I'm going to be doing is rubbing out on this side and I'm getting all of this fuzz over here. I come in with this side and I do it just hitting my side of the face. Then I turn it around and I hit just the other side of the face. So you're always working with the grain. Um, and particularly, let me pull this out, when I'm working on something that's out of focus again, when I'm working on this handle, um, on this particular one I have the grain running here because I have the center board with the grain running vertical. Uh, no, excuse me, this one, the grain's running um, vertical on this um, with the center board running this way. Uh, normally all the grain is running in this direction. Uh, this is actually um, um, striped. Uh, maple. So the grain is actually running this way on it. Um, what was I just saying? Oh yeah, grain direction. So because the grain on this is running up this way, when I'm coming to this end here, I want to make sure that my rasp and file is running off the grain this way. I don't want to be up here running this way because right now with this, I've got all of these fibers hanging out this way. So if I come in this direction, I'm going to be popping and tearing those fibers out. So at this point, I want to come in and I want to file down here. So I'm always reading the direction of the grain so that I'm filing away from it, making sure all those fibers lay down flat rather than peeling them up and pulling them away. So just like anything else with hand tools, it comes down to reading the grain and changing the direction. What's next? Uh, let's see. Angela Carey asks, do you have any reproduction of tool catalogs for being a member? I get the grist mill and that's all I've received. Yes. Um, the, the last, I'm trying to remember when the last one came out. Um, because of, of COVID, the, the reprinting of those um, was put on hold. They are coming back out here soon. I haven't heard what the next one is. Um, I'm hoping to hear what that is at the June meet. Um, usually the reproduction catalogs come out once a year. Um, and then you get the grist mill four times a year. Um, and so just for those of you who don't know, when you join the MWTCA, um, you get invited to the, the local meets and you can, um, um, you can actually um, see more. Um, we're trying to redo the website on that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a little annoying. Um, but you get the, the grist mill four times a year, which is a magazine um, dedicated to um, the history of tools. And you'll get little dives into a type of tool or a family of tools or a maker of tools um, and someone doing a little research and background on it. Um, and then they do a reproductions of catalogs or sometimes the old books um, and um, print those out. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what the next one will be. Um, and just for you, those who know, I actually just was voted in as the, uh, let's see, vice president of membership. Um, and uh, they want to get someone in who owns a smartphone. Uh, so, I thought you were going to um, say under the age of... Under the age of 100? 65? <laughs> um, no, but I, I joke, but it's... it's uh, things are going to be changing soon, so stay tuned. For, for the better. Fun. Yes. For the better. Um, and it's not, it's not just me coming in. Everyone there wants to make things happen. 
um, and it's just finding out where. And it's a slow moving machine, but uh, the MWTCA is going to have a lot of fun, fun, fun things coming up soon. So stay tuned. <laughs> What's next? Well, Aaron Munn just super chatted and said, just to hear Lady Sarah rather than James. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. All the way on the other they side. They know where their bread's buttered. Coming from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is a bad one. What happens when you put your hand in a blender? What? You get a handshake. <laughs> yeah, 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 I like that one. That's good. <laughs> I'm very dark and twisted tonight. That's why I'm married. Guillotine, you. blended hands. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Sweet dreams, James. <laughs> <laughs> That's my word. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Brandon Chanel asked, "What grit is your finest file?" <laughs> um, it's. Uh, Grit, grit is, um, uh, I don't know. Here, let me clean this one out so you can see it a little better. Um, and also for files and rasp, get a good card file, a file card, um, and uh, you clean them out. Some people hate the idea of using a steel or wire brush. Um, I actually like it. Some people prefer just the nylon, uh, but it's amazing how much nicer a uh, file works when you clean it out. Okay, let me zoom in on this one and give you a visual representation of it. Um, oops, there we are on that already. Now I get you back in focus. There we go. So you can see the teeth size there. It's uh, about that size. I don't know. What would that be? Small. Like 60? I don't know. Um, it's generally considered extra fine. Um, and I can get a finish ready um, finish off of that. What's next? Mr. Forbanging uh, said best wood for hand plane handle. Um, traditionally, it was rosewood. Um, and you can get uh, like Bolivian rosewood now. Um, and that's actually really good for it. But in all honesty, whatever you want. Um, I like this one's walnut. I love that. Uh, maple. I've got a couple of those. Um, that one's walnut. This one's live oak. Ooh la la. I love that one. Um, apple and cherry. Um, a lot of the fruit woods um, are very, very common. Um, saw handles historically, at least in America, were made out of apple wood. Um, it's one of those things where you, you really aren't going to go wrong. As long as it's durable and not going to really wear out, I wouldn't go any softer than something like cherry. Um, but uh, if you like it, give it a shot. And the nice thing about it is if it does break, you know how to make another one. <laughs> yeah, um, so there, there really is no best. And if you talk to any of the really good um, woodworkers, um, saw makers, they're going to have a whole list of... Um, uh, woods you can pick from and a lot of them will even say yeah send in whatever wood you have we'll make a handle out of it because uh, they uh, it's, it's really personal preference what's next uh, Brian Fetterson asks do you ever find yourself overworking pieces like the totes and regretting doing so when you look at it later um overworking it no I have a couple that I've underworked well, like this one um, on my, my tenon saw, um, this one's out of Live Oak. And I just ran out of time for the video to do this one, to finish it off. Um, I did the other two and got those really, really nice. This one just needs a little bit more work. Uh, you can see a little bit of scuff work back here. I just haven't done the final smoothing on it. Um, but it's one of those things where, yeah, do I really need it? Because the shape is there, the handle is there. It fits my hand the way I want it. Um, it just has a little bit of roughness to it. Um, so maybe one of these days I'll finish it off. Um, but have I ever regretted going overboard and really detailing it down? No. Because when it's really, really done well, like these ones, uh, uh, Jared Green, it's just... Oh, I mean, that's not overdone. It's just beautiful. And the smoother and cleaner you get it, the more it just feels good. Um, so no. Don't worry about overdoing it. Have fun with it. 
And at some point you'll be like, yeah, it's good enough. Because you'll never get to the point where it's perfect. There's always some other little defect you'll want to smooth out on it. And then the first time you use it, it'll get a scratch. And it's like, ooh, I should go back and clean that up. So don't worry about it. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. John Hayes asks, are files for steel the same for wood, or are the teeth different? <laughs> yes. Um, you will see some that are specifically sold for wood, and others that are specifically sold for metal. But if they work on metal, they'll work on wood. Um, there, there really is no magical difference between them. They are both um, extra hard, hardened steel. Um, tooth geometry is the same. Functionality is the same. Uh, you'll hear some small details of, ooh, this is better because of that, or, oh, you shouldn't use it because, but honestly, it, it's the same thing. Um, so don't, uh, yeah. If, if you find one for metal, it'll work on wood. Um, sometimes you will find them, the ones that say um, that are there are specifically for wood, um, that they aren't hardened quite as much, so they become a little bit more ductile, so when you drop them, they don't shatter. Um, in that case, don't use those ones on metal, um, but anything made from metal will work on wood fine. What's next? Alan Lewis asked, what about a pattern maker's wood rasp? Have you ever used it before? They're very fine and cut half round. Yes. Um, it, it's basically um, a more detailed version of a cabinet maker's rasp. Um, and one of the things when it comes to files and rasps and rifflers and floats um, is the names. Um, every, every occupation is going to have a different name for it. And then you go to a different tradition and a different timeline, and the same file will have a half dozen to two dozen different names. Um, and so you'll hear, you know, cabinet makers, um, you'll hear um, pattern makers, you'll hear chair makers, um, and you'll hear all of these other names that the name means nothing. Look at the shape and ask yourself, do I have that particular shape? No, hmm, maybe I should pick it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about the, the names particularly. Um, the shape is what matters. The, um, the grit of the tooth is what matters. Hmm. Dennis Miko asks, do you have a video showing how to hand cut the tote from a block of wood and how to choose the block of wood? Um, no, I have a video on making uh, this saw handle right here, actually, um, I, it's a detailed video on the, the saw handle, which is basically the same thing. If you can make one of these, you can make one of these. Uh, a tote is so much easier than a saw handle because it doesn't wrap back around. Uh, these are, are very, very quick and easy um, in comparison to a saw handle. Um, so, no, I don't. However, I'm making this one right now, and I will soon have a video on this. Uh, but I don't know when that will come out because this, one's, this one is a collaboration with uh, a few others. So um, stay tuned for when that one's coming out. Which is kind of support. Actually, no, I do have. I do have a video on that. Oh, I've got two videos on that. Of course I do. <laughs> I was like, you don't. <laughs> yeah, um, I did one with a, it was a 10 and a half, I think it was. No, no, it was the one with the, with the tilting handle. I made one for that and I have a video on that one. Um, and then I made one for a transitional and I made a, a video on that tote as well. Um, as to picking the grain for it, um, normally you want on a tote, you want the grain to go parallel with the sole, um, and that, um, going that way, or within a few degrees one way or the other. Um, I, in these ones, I actually put the inside grain running parallel with the sole and the outside grain running vertically and basically turning it into a small piece of plywood. That means it's going to have a little bit of movement and shape over time, but not a huge amount. And as long as it's taken care of, it's not going to be a, a big problem. Um, and so you do see some of these plywood ones. Um, interestingly enough, one of the most durable and strong handles you're ever going to find is a plywood handle. Um, that you can drop them, you can bash them, you can bang them, and they last so much longer. Um, but a lot of people are like, ooh, plywood. But honestly, it's, it's one of the strongest and best handles you're ever going to have. Um, as long as the plywood's void free, it works really well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, one of the reasons why you don't have the grain running vertical is if you have the grain running vertical on a solid block of wood, this uh, horn is just going to break off instantly. Um, it's one of those things, and the, the toe over here is going to break off uh, because you're always putting um, forward pressure on it. This is just going to snap right off. 
Um, so you want the grain running parallel to the sole or a little bit off of it. That gives you the full strength here. Now it does mean you're going to find a lot of totes that are broken across there, but the nice thing about that is you can very quickly and easily glue them back together. Um, so when they do break, they're easy repairs. Whereas if they break the other way, you can't repair them. They're a lost cause. So, yeah. What's next? That's it. We're caught up? Cool. Well, uh, yeah, it's about wrapping time, so we're going to wrap this up. Um, I am thinking next week we're going to start working on the, uh, um, the joinery window. Again? Uh, I, yeah, it's been two years. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. No. Yeah. Just did it. March. It was March of 2021. No, it was not. Yep. Um, and then we did it two years before that. And it's one of those fun ones to pull out every now and then because you actually get to see how your skills have changed over time. So we might be doing that one again. Um, and if I do, I'm going to try and give people a heads up on the hive mind um, so you can get the stuff as well and build along with me. And I'll have plans. So if you want to do the lives and actually build the joinery window with me, um, we'll have fun with doing that. So... Uh, I think they'll do it. If any of you are coming to the upcoming meets, looking forward to seeing you. And until next time, have a wonderful day.